Hello again, it's uh, Paul Beckwith. So, in the previous uh, two videos, I've been discussing the Pistone et al. paper published in 2019, which looks at what would happen um, with the complete loss of Arctic sea ice during the summer months. So how much additional heating would there be uh, both in the Arctic or if you average the heating as a result of the Arctic over the entire planet. And basically between 1979 and 2011, or 20, even 2016, not much difference between those two, the, the reflectivity, um, the, the additional heating would be was 0 0.21 watts per square, per square meter averaged over the whole planet. Complete loss of Arctic sea ice, that number goes up to 0 0.71 watts per square meter, which is a huge, huge impact. It's really going to monkey with the jet streams. It's really going to impact or, or it's really going to be detrimental to growing food and feeding the people on this planet. So let me get um, uh, right back into the figures. So this was a key plot which I explained in the previous video. This is where we are, 1979 to 2016, the black curve. If you take 0, 0, these are the months with light, and 0, 0, 0, the average is 0 0.21 watts per square meter. That's been realized so far. With completely ice-free, so 1979 to the ice-free state, whatever year that happens in, probably sooner than later, you know, four years, five years, who knows for sure, you know, a decade, then the heating is incredible. Um, September, loss of ice in September, September itself is not going to be a huge difference, but it's the lowering of the ice in the earlier months. A complete loss of ice in the earlier months gives you the absorbed solar um, av radiation average globally relative to 79 you know, would be huge, 2.24 watts per square meter at the peak, you know. So these March, April, May, June, July, August, the loss of ice there has a huge impact on the additional absorption because the sun angle is much higher in the Arctic and the albedo is therefore way, way lower. And, uh, you know, we have a huge problem. And this is with invariant cloudiness conditions. Okay, so... Um, so this ice albedo climate feedback describes how there's ice loss associated with global warming and this ice loss leads to additional radiative heating. This feedback is typically expressed in terms of the amount of additional heating per degree of global warming. Um, now people are obviously focused on the month of September, which is a time of summer minimum ice extent and also the month that has seen the fastest rate of ice extent retreat in recent decades. Okay, but, you know, if you look at this figure, September alone is not the month that causes all the, all the problems, the additional heating. It's the, the declining sea ice in the rest of the summer because the sun angle is much higher. So the, the impact actually peaks in, in May. This is June, July also very high in April, okay, huge in those months. Okay, so basically, um, so, so I'll talk about some more details here. Um, and, uh, but basically this is the key factor, the 0 0.71 watts per square meter of that's the annual mean, annual mean, global mean radiative heating, okay, over all the months of the year. It's equivalent to 1 trillion tons of additional CO2 emissions. That's equivalent to 25 years of global warming at present rates. That will rocket us well above the, you know, any of the Paris guard bands, the two degrees, one and a half degrees. Okay, now a couple other key points. Um, the Arctic Ocean is defined as a land-free area, poleward of 60 degrees north. Okay, it's, the series data is a 17-year period from 2000 to 2016, and it measures the radiation above a certain spot. 
of the Arctic. So you can measure the Arctic ice-free locations of the Arctic, get the radiative forcing, extrapolate over the area to the whole Arctic and figure out what's going to go on with a complete loss of Arctic sea ice. Then you look at the clouds. We can talk about the clear sky albedo with ice-free conditions and no clouds. That's one extreme. We can talk about the completely overcast conditions when 95%, greater than 95% of the sky is clouded in. And then we can talk about the scenario where the clouds um, don't change properties that much. Um, and that's the third case, which gives you the 0 0.71 number. Now, how do you calculate the 1 trillion tons equivalents? The radiative forcing, F, is you can calculate using this formula. Um, it's for an arbitrary reference value, R, relative to uh, you know, the atmospheric concentration, what it is. So basically, you can calculate that a doubling of atmospheric CO2 gives you a radiative forcing of 3.71. That's the formula to do that. But with a radiative forcing of 0.71, that would be equivalent to a rise of CO2 from 400 to 456. PPM, 1 PPM is equivalent to 7.77 gigatons. So this increase of 56.7 uh, would weigh 441 gigatons, but that would be the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. But the emissions don't all go stay in the atmosphere. It's only estimated that about 0.44 or 44% of them do, okay, stay in the atmosphere. So if you divide 441 by 0.44, you get about a trillion tons. So a trillion tons of emissions, 441 gigatons would stay in the atmosphere. That would cause the, the rise of, of uh, CO2 by this amount, and that would take about 25 years at present emission rates. So that's where you get the, the uh, trillion tons. Okay, as clear as mud, or clearer, I hope. Okay, so again, it's very important to, this, this is key, this is key, and I'll post uh, the images of, the, of these figures. I'll, I'll make sure they're, they're tweeted out so you can, can copy them, you can get a hold of them. Now, in terms of the supplementary material, um, Basically, the, uh, you know, there's, the key thing is there's many factors that contribute to changes in planetary albedo, including atmospheric aerosols. Okay, that's the particles going up. So these Australian fires are putting huge numbers of aerosols into the atmosphere. The water vapor, the surface types, so the reflectivity, sea ice concentration and properties. But the dominant factor governing the planetary albedo, clear sky planetary albedo above ice-free locations in the Arctic is the solar zenith angle, okay, which is governed by the cosine of the latitude and the season based on the orbital geometry. Okay, So it's the angle of the sun relative to the horizon. So when you're in the Arctic, you know, the sun's still south of you, you get a glancing incidence and the the, the uh, smaller the angle, the greater the solar zenith angle, um, the, um, you know, if, you're, if the sun's vertically overhead, you're gonna, it's, most of the light's going to be absorbed. If the sun's at a very sh shallow angle, as we see when it's set setting, you get high reflectivity from the surface. Just think of looking across a calm lake, um, and you can see upside down trees. You know, if, if you're looking across a calm lake, and there's to an island, and there's trees on the island, and the water's perfectly still, then you can see the trees upside down in the water because you're getting very, very high reflectivity. You know, the further away you are, the shallower the angle, the higher the reflectivity. Okay, same sort of thing is happening. When the sun's low on the horizon, then it's more is going to reflect off. The ref reflectance varies greatly depending on that solar zenith angle. So that's, that's a key point. And there's some other details in there, but, you know, I think I'll kind of stop there on the paper. So, so this is very, very important stuff because as we head to a blue ocean event, um, we're going to see tremendous warming in the Arctic and this lets us know how much warming we can expect. So now um, I really, this year, you know, 2020, um, 
you know, I love doing these videos. I love trying to figure out the science and stuff. My, my biggest uh, weakness, apart from battling battles with Shackleton, as you saw in a video a few videos ago, um, I should just show you. You can probably, I don't know if you can see, you know, the scratches. I didn't, I obviously lost that battle. But, you know, it's trying to get this important interpretation, um, important findings from the science out to the public because we're in a climate emergency. Our world is changing rapidly, but hey, we ain't seen nothing yet. And we ain't done anything uh, yet. So please follow my Twitter at Paul H. Beckwith if you don't. If you're not on Twitter, just get it's free. Just get an account. Just follow me. See what I have to say. You can get more information. You know, you don't. Um, and I'll follow you back if you follow me, so you can communicate with me, send me messages, etc. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, a tweet on the last couple papers, uh, the last couple videos that I've done. This is to come. I'm go I got to talk a, a lot about Australia. Um, I'll do that very, very soon. Um, so also on Facebook, um, this is my uh, Facebook page now. Um, I do, uh, you know, I do, I, I, I should go through and find inactive people and that will create a lot more people, but you can send me a Facebook request there. Um, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, this is a public group page. So anybody, there's no limit to the number of people that can follow me here, so you can go to public groups and find me there. I should probably, I look like orange there. I, I, look, I don't want to look orange. I should probably change that picture. It's just kind of a weird picture. Quirky picture. You can go there and there's also, um, you know, this is who I am and these are some of the comments about what people have said about me. You know, uh, basically joining the dots on climate change. Um, and then of course, WordPress. Um, paulbeckwith.net. You can find me. Please, con please uh, consider contributing, and I will really try to get a big, a bigger and, and better reach this year. You know, it's a bit discouraging. You know, I have almost twenty thousand follow. You know, people that um, that subscribe on YouTube. You know, and you go to some channels full of complete nonsense and junk and crazy stuff, and they have like millions. So. You know, we're, we're up against, um, you know, we've got our work cut out for us. Um, and of course, you can also go directly to my YouTube channel. Um, you can just go on YouTube, search for Paul Beckwith, subscribe, and, uh, you know, please make comments on the video. So on this particular video, you know, please comment. Um, I'll just turn it around. So on this particular um, video, you know, please comment on, you know, if you've got a lot of experience with social media, you know, if you know I, like if you really love Quora or, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I have, account, I have an Instagram account. I don't use it that much. Um, you know, it's mostly Twitter stuff. I do the videos in YouTube. Um, I share them on Twitter. You know, I post them, usually post them on Facebook, although I haven't been doing that so much um, for every video lately. Um, and that's about the extent, um, you know, I really rely on you, my audience, to, you know, if you like this stuff, if you think it's worthwhile and you think, you know, you're, as you get more concerned about climate change, you know, please, 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 the best thing you can do to help me is to share, you know, share to your friends on social media, send emails to people in environmental groups, you know, just try to help me. I can't do it all, all myself. So just try to help me get a uh, wider readership, get me on TV programs in your countries. Um, I've had more success in Canada lately than I have in the past. And uh, thanks again for listening. And, uh, you know, we got we to gotta knuckle down in 2020 and uh, face, face the, the risks and address them, um, you know, and not, not screw around anymore. Anyway, thanks again for for listening.